you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. No, I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Ah. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I've often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens. Is married life so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I've had very little experience of myself up to the present. I've only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir, it is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I'm sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Pleasure. Pleasure? What else should bring mine anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Angie. Well, I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. <laughs> what on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbours. Neighbours. Got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire? Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Eh? Shropshire? Hmm. Oh, yes, of course. Hello? Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Well, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. Oh, perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. And may I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. But I thought you'd come up for pleasure. Like all that business. How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love. But there is nothing romantic at all about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. And the very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Well, there's no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Now, please, don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. <laughs> You've been eating them all the time. That is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. Have some bread and butter. But the bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Mmm. And very good bread and butter it is, too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat it as if you're going to eat it all. God, you behave as if you're married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. <laughs> that is nonsense. It isn't. It's a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algie, by Cecily? I don't know anybody by the name of Cecily. Mm. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? Well, I wish to goodness you'd let me know I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. Well, it's not good offering a large reward now to think it's found. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. However, it makes no matter. For now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. And you have no right whatsoever to read what's written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it's absurd to make a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. 
More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case. Please. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. Now, this cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is too, lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, aren't you? But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. That is absurd. Now, for heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle, hmm? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all, it's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You've always told me it was Ernest. Well, I've introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest-looking person I ever saw in my life. It's perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards, yes, here is one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany. I'll keep this as a proof that your name is Ernest, if ever you attempt to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small Aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come, old boy, you'd much better have the thing out at once. I may mention that I've always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunbrist? What on earth do you mean by Bunbrist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now produce your explanation. And pray, make it improbable. My dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it is perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle, from motives of respect which you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bunbury all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. But go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Andrew, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It is one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness. In order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear young Algie, is the whole truth, pure and simple. Well, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to people who haven't been at university. They do it so well in the daily papers. Now, what you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunburyist. Well, you are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest, in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I shouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at the Savoy, for I've really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. 